Please come to order. Facing three. Please come in, take. Please come to order. All right, Mr. O'Connor, you have the floor. Please come in and sit down or, or come on. We're starting. Why, please, Mr. O'Connor has the floor. All right, everybody sit down, come on. Shh. All right, go ahead, Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, Precinct 19. I just have a couple of uh, comments and then I have a Can question. Can we shut the doors? Hold on, Jim. Can we shut the doors in the back so those people who don't want to sit down and come in? I'll, I'll, I'll restart the clock for you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. When we talk about these issues about parking, the first thing that came to mind when I was looking at the presentation that Mr. Harrington gave us was there was a Vermont license plate. Vermont's kind of a long commute. It's probably not somebody that lives here. I used to live in Vermont. And I can say that my question is about whether or not people are parking where we're not enforcing regulations so that it's what I would consider selective enforcement. That's like telling people, like an animal farm, all things were equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now certainly, I don't believe that the suggestion that the municipal government officials or firefighters or anyone else that happens to park in the cemetery is not going to be exempted from a ticket. But the second question about this is the Commonwealth has certain laws about auto excise tax. It has certain regulations about parking permits that we give to town residents to park in our town lots overnight. And if the picture is correct that Mr. Harrington put up, that Vermont vehicle sits there for days on end. It may be a residence who says, I don't have to pay for parking because I can park in the cemetery. Nobody there is going to complain. <laughs> but the fact is, as we've heard from one of our fellow speakers, we have a concern. These people have gladly paid through their bereaved for perpetual care. They have a voice. They're entitled to receive the benefits that they paid for. And every time we talk about legislation, we try to protect the rights of others. So I think that's kind of an issue that we need to address. Selective enforcement, breach of protection of those that have paid for perpetual care, and that we don't want to abet tax evaders. We don't want to acknowledge, OK, you can park over there because nobody's going to look. So I suggested it to the petitioner that maybe we table the article, but he asked that we take a vote tonight. So I'm going to defer to his initiative because he put a lot of work into this. But I do think that we do need to consider protecting those people. So I want to ask the Board of Selectmen if any one of you would care to speak. You have to talk into the mic, uh, Mr. sir. Mr. Moderator. Yes, sir. Could you ask the Board of Selectmen, whoever would like to come forward, to tell us how we could enforce this to protect those that have paid for this right? Mr. Byrne? Um, or well, I think the only person who couldn't, we, we've answered the enforcement issue a number of times, is the police have well, to enforce it. Well, the police enforce it, but there's the question of are, You're basically asking, are they going to, the parking. In, are they, as parking commission is going to do something about this? Yes. Mr. Byrne. Um, Stephen Byrne, Board of Selectmen Chair. Um, yes, I do think that we, um, especially after how contentious, or not contentious, but how long this debate has been and how it's clearly 
um, a very serious issue to everyone in town. I think that Chief Ryan was correct that there are some extenuating circumstances right now and that following the conclusion of those circumstances, um, we will take the appropriate measures to look into the cemetery uh, parking concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I hope whatever the vote outcome is tonight that we do that. Because those people that can't speak, that paid for this, may consider this a breach of trust. And when we do that, we don't really act as legislators, do we? Because our intention is to give everybody equal rights. So I think this issue has been aired, and I think it's important to consider how we do our business to make sure that everybody is taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Fuller. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, the proponent of the substitute motion when he presented to us the other night made a claim that there are presently no regulations on parking in the cemetery. So I said to myself, I'm going to check this. So I went on the town website and looked at the cemetery commission regulations, looked at the selectman's parking rules and orders. And sure enough, he's right. There's nothing in either place that specifically regulates, prohibits, conditions parking in the cemetery. So we're left with a situation now where there's some no parking signs. It's a bit of a mystery how they got there. And the default is people park in the cemetery like they can't find a space. I'll go park in the cemetery. So this is a tough decision on this substitute motion. It's not a perfect instrument, but I'm going to vote for it. I think it gives us a chance, you know, as the legislative voice of the town to lay down a marker that says we don't like what's going on now. We don't like that using the cemetery as a temporary parking lot for people who are inconvenienced by street congestion or construction is the proper thing to do. It goes against the whole purpose, the whole idea, the whole dignity of the cemetery, and it needs to stop. So I'm going to vote for it. I hope it passes. If it doesn't pass, I hope the cemetery commission and or the selectman, whoever wants to assert some jurisdiction, writes some rules that, you know, make the spirit of the substitute motion happen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ted Peluso. Ted Peluso, Precinct 6, uh, somebody told me tonight, I talk simply. And uh, when I look at uh, a cemetery, I say to myself, is there anybody in this room, police chief, employees of the town, everybody in this room, who would go out of their, out of their way to disrespect a dead person? I don't think so. I think what we might be faced with here is something fell between the cracks of the system of committees and commissions. And if I'm reading this right, and this young man here told me just now that we don't have a law that says you cannot park there, then we need a law that can park there. Does it need a bylaw? I don't know. But if that's the only way you're going to get it, then I think we should have a law that says you're not allowed to park in the cemetery unless you're on cemetery business. It's easy, right? Uh, parking is a big problem everywhere. Where I came from was a big problem. And now you get into the whole issue of enforcement. Well, you know what? If the law isn't on the books, how can you enforce it? So we got to get it on the books somehow, and if this is the only way it's going to happen, then let it happen. Once you have it on the books, we have to trust our police department, 
who I believe do a good job overall, and we have to trust them that they will enforce it fairly. And that's the way I see it. So if we're using something that is, uh, you know, like a, 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 whatever you call it, a, a, a huge hammer to put in a little tiny nail because something got missed along the way with, this, uh, with these commissions and committees that we have, Let's correct it tonight and get it over with already, okay? Thank you, sir. Sean Harrington. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. I would um, like to move to, e to amend uh, Mr. Harrington's substitute motion um, by striking the words conducting cemetery business and replacing them with visiting the cemetery. Um, is that possible, Mr. Moderator? That's, that's small enough to do. All right. Thank you. you have that in writing? Um, yes. Um, hopefully by changing those three simple words we can stop any possible dilemma police officers would have if this is um, uh, voted on by town meeting. A few months ago, a very good friend of mine passed away who was a longtime Arlington activist. Um, this was back in the fall. I went to, um, <clears throat> when we went to have the funeral um, for him, we noticed that there were cars parked in the cemetery near the spot that didn't belong in the cemetery. Cemetery, I should rephrase that, that we didn't see anyone with those cars or in the cemetery, in that vicinity of the cemetery um, that could have owned those cars. Um, one of the people who were in attendance was a former mayor of one of the large cities near or next to Arlington, one of our neighbors. After the cemetery service was over, um, I began to talk to uh, the former mayor who uh, asked me, he said, uh, son, can you tell me, uh, are those cars belonging to anyone here for the funeral? I said, well, no, I assume that they're parking there. And he said, so that's how they do it in Arlington. Huh. So that's how we do it in Arlington. That was one of the few times I ever felt ashamed of saying I was from Arlington. That a former elected official of another town, not even an elected official, someone visiting the town, thought, that's how Arlington treats their dead? That's how Arlington pays respect to those who have died? To quote Sir William Gladstone, um, show me the way in which a society treats their dead, and I will show you with mathematical exactness how they, look, how they treat their laws, how they treat their living, and the morals of that society. What are we saying about our town? When we have people parking in the cemetery, not for cemetery purposes, not there for any, um, for want of a better word, positive use of the cemetery. I mean, we could get into splitting hairs saying that, oh, well, what if I'm bird watching or what if I'm this or that? I think we can all say that those are positive uses of the cemetery. They're not abuses. We're using the cemetery. We are, if anything, honoring the dead, honoring such a, pla a place of great beauty, of calmness, a place of great thought by using the cemetery for those reasons. Parking in the cemetery and leaving your car there solely so it's a less of a walk to get to your car is an abuse in my mind. And if there is a problem with uh, the community safety building having parking, then I would recommend we put parking for the, sem uh, for the community safety building only on Mystic Street. If we want to solve that problem, it's an easy solution that we can look at. I'm amazed we're even having this debate, really. I mean, let's put it this way. For my English class um, in college, one, we had to do a problem solution essay and present it to our class. I did it exactly on this issue in which 
the teacher had it that he would give his own conclusion and then all of our classmates would then give their ideas for solutions to the problem. Do you know what they said? Put in a law to have people stop parking in the cemetery. If people from Charlestown and Somerville and Boston and the South Shore can understand that, why is it that we can't? Let's have some respect for the dead. Let's try to use the cemetery for positive use. Let's stop the abuse. I really ask you to vote for this substitute motion. So Arlington has not looked at a community as that former mayor said of, that's how they do it. Let's prove them wrong. Let's prove them wrong that that's not how Arlington does it. We don't tolerate that and we will no longer tolerate that. Thank you. All right, so he's made a substitute motion to strike out the words conducting cemetery business and inserting the words visiting the cemetery in their place. Do I have a second on that? Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Berger, Eric, is he here tonight? No. Huh? Brian Hasbrock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm uh, Brian Hasbrook from Precinct 9. And I have a disclosure. I'm actually an abutter of the cemetery. I'm on Sherborne Street, and the back of my house faces the cemetery. I see it every day. Um, I also go out for a run in the morning, and at the end of my run, I walk through the cemetery for Mystic. Um, I've walked all over the place, and I want to correct a few impressions that might have been made from previous speakers. First of all, I don't believe there has been an abuse of parking in the cemetery. I also think, or I, I am confident, that once the construction in Mystic Avenue and, and the public safety building is over, that the parking problem on Sachem will be greatly reduced. I recommend that you vote against the original substitute motion I think uh, the previous speaker's suggestion for the amendment that it be clarified to visiting the cemetery, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, need, I need time to think about it. Um, we have a long tradition in this country, dating back to the 19th century, of cemeteries being used for passive recreation. Many of our cemeteries, including Mount Pleasant, are situated in sites that are for, for lack of a better term, just simply beautiful. As you walk through the cemetery and rise up um, onto the hill, I think it's back on Laurel Avenue back there, you, you get up on the hill and you see the Mystic Lake before you, and at different times of the year, it's simply beautiful. And from time to time, people will visit and they'll park their cars there. And there are, there are at least six benches um, around the cemetery. From time to time, people will park and just sit. I don't know whether they have a loved one that is buried nearby. I just think it's nice that they can go there and sit. Right now, the staff, of the, uh, the cemetery commission and the staff that work there, if there is a funeral coming through, they can go up to someone who's sitting at a bench and saying, you know, look, we have a funeral. Could you come back tomorrow? Occasionally, there might be a problem and perhaps Sachem Ave was a special problem for a while, where it's not as simple as that. Uh, a car is parked, um, the person isn't there, you know, maybe they're a commuter, or maybe they've just gone for a long walk. In my experience, and I'm there a lot, I have not seen, with the exception of the Sachem Avenue area, I, have, I haven't seen regular parking. You know, people are just doing this all the time. It is, it is by and large, respected. Um, so I, I think we're on the right track with this, trying to, to narrow it a little bit. Um, at this point, I'm inclined to suggest to uh, vote no and continue to support the status quo a little bit longer. Uh, I, I agree with um, Police Chief Ryan. We're going to get some more experience on this as the projects have wi wound down. And I'd like for us to come back and reconsider that. Um, thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bolt. No, no, you're not up. I'm just recognizing you. I'm just saying, yeah, you're on the list. Hi, Barbara Boltz, Precinct 9. I appreciate the remarks of the previous speaker because I, too, I live on 
Medford Street adjacent to the cemetery, and I walk in the cemetery two or three times a week at least. I also have never seen the problem that's been described, although I can't say that it doesn't exist because I don't walk there every day or 24 hours a day. But let me tell you something interesting. When I walk in the cemetery, I see very few cars parked. And when I do see a car, I see someone at a grave site or someone sitting on a bench reading a book. I don't see anyone defiling anything. Yes, the roads are in bad shape, but as far as the perpetual care, the cemetery workers, they're mowing, they're raking, they take good care of that cemetery. And I'd like to enlighten you as to what the signs at the cemetery really say. Because when this debate began the other night, I went over there yesterday and looked at the sign on Medford Street at each of the three gates when you drive into the cemetery. There's a sign. <clears throat> the first one is big letters, speed limit 15. Well, needless to say, that's not observed when people use it to cut through between Mystic and Medford. That's the worst thing about walking. Then there's another sign that says, hours dawn to dusk. But as has been pointed out, the gates are never closed. There are gates, but they're never closed. I don't know if anybody goes in there after dusk. I certainly don't. The next sign underneath it is written in much smaller letters. Anyone driving in won't even read it because they won't even see it. It says, prohibited practices. Then it says in capital letters, N-O, no consumption of alcohol. No dogs allowed. No motorized recreational vehicles. Then it says in big letters, only persons with cemetery business allowed on grounds. Underneath that, in all capital letters, it says, violators are subject to arrest. Per order, Arlington Cemetery Commission. It says not one word about parking. Not one word. There are no, no parking signs in the cemetery, contrary to what people have told you tonight. Uh, I enjoy walking in the cemetery for reasons other people have said. It's quiet, it's beautiful. Right now in the springtime, the trees are, are blooming, the birds are singing. You're walking along the Mill Brook. You come to the wetlands. It's beautiful. I know people go there birding. People also walk their dogs in the cemetery. I've never seen one off leash. But according to this, they shouldn't be there either. I shouldn't be there either because I'm not on cemetery business. So perhaps these rules have to be changed and amended somewhat. But I am absolutely opposed to this uh, substitute motion because I don't think, number one, I don't think it's enforceable. And number two, uh, it would keep people from parking there and reading and walking and enjoying the beauty and the tranquility of the cemetery. So I urge you to vote no on this uh, substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, Mr. Deist. John Dice, Precinct 13. Uh, it's very clear to everyone here that Stephen Harrington has done us a service. He's pointed out a very difficult problem. Uh, I was, when I went to the cemetery, when I, when I saw his presentation uh, at the previous meeting, uh, I was appalled at some of the views of what looked like destruction of the area where this parking is. I have to confess, however, I went down there today, and that region, that 150 feet or so at the beginning, uh, is no better and no worse, in my opinion, 
from other places in the cemetery. It looks pretty much the same. And I urge any of you to go down and take a look for yourselves. Uh, I don't know about the parking. He, Stephen, has looked at the parking a good deal more than I have. We've been told that it's a temporary problem. We've also been told that the uh, people in the town who are responsible for parking, that is to say the selectmen, are going to solve the problem. Well, guess what? If they don't solve the problem in a year from now, we get to haul them over the coals rather beautifully. So I think, I think that what we, should, what we should do is take them at their word. And hopefully, they will come back with us with a solution that answers any number of problems that are brought up here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Fisher. Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Uh, I feel whipsawed by this a bit. <laughs> I mean, uh, first thing I have to say is uh, it turns out I'm a scofflaw because um, I often work out of my brother's shop, which is in the ink, the old Rosen Ink building. And I learned from Mr. Harriman and a town official that that road is also probably, uh, well, actually it is uh, part of the part of the uh, cemetery. Um, so I, I think that I I I want I want to make a motion to table, and I, I tell you the reason is I I think. I'd like to vote yes just to show that, that we're hearing that this can be dealt with, but we're also hearing that the, the, the cemetery commission itself has, has had this problem for seven years. Um, so it's likely to pass, and, it, and it's, it's a law that's like a sledgehammer. It's, it's, and what's, what, what are they supposed to do with it? So, and I think that town meeting does a disservice to itself by making such laws and so at risk of uh you know making everything a torture i i move we table this for two weeks and i move that uh, we recommend i mean i'm sorry i didn't have it the wherewithal to do a resolution but if i were to do a resolution i would recommend that the uh, cemetery commission the proponent other interested parties the the enforcing parties you, sit down and hammer something out that does work because I think we're going to pass something that doesn't work tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm making, nobody wants a second. You've so made three motions so far. I'm, I'm making a motion to table for two weeks, still two well, weeks from That's tonight. a motion to postpone. Po the motion postpone. to the table is we just put it on the table and let it sit till you feel like taking it off. A motion to the table is to a date certain, excuse me, postpone is to a date certain. I mean, in a way, if we vote yes, what we're, or even if we vote no, we're, we're basically saying to the selectmen, we want you to fix it in a year, and we might as well just say fix it in two weeks. So what do you want to do, Andy? And make it a motion to table, uh, to, uh, to, to postpone till to uh, what two, day? Weeks, two weeks from tonight. Uh, I can't do the math, I'm sorry. 7, 14? I hope we're not in session on the 14th. How about the 12th? It's fine with May me. May 12th. Fine with me. Okay, so it's a motion to postpone to May 12th. I have a second. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, you lose. Oh, well, thank you anyway. Uh, Phil Goff. New guy. Hi, Phil Goff, Precinct 7. Um, some of you are going to hate me, and I apologize. I know many of you are, have waited patiently to speak, but I do think town meeting has a lot of business tonight and um, for the rest of the spring, so I want to move to terminate debate on this article and all matters before. You said too many words. All you can say to terminate is I motion to terminate debate on all matters before the article. Otherwise, you can't make motion to terminate debate. So you okay. may as well say can, something else and then may, move on. May I still ask? Can I still ask a question then? You can. I, you still okay. have time. I want to recommend that perhaps someone after me uh, <laughs> moves to terminate debate. Uh, but I, I do want to ask, and this is a serious question because I, I know that uh, you know, a lot of the discussion has been that this has been a problem during construction, and I, I can understand why. Can anyone speak to this, uh, the parking problem in the cemetery, whether it did exist, and if so, how bad it was prior to any construction 
uh, at the public safety building. Right. First, either we'll a town official or perhaps Chief, Mr. Chief Harrington. Ryan, as he has the best view of that street in the world. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. I do have a good view. It's a glimpse into my future, right? Um, <laughs> in all of our future. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, uh, the fire apparatus uh, does park there during training exercises, and that has been ongoing um, prior to the construction. The personal vehicular uh, traffic uh, that parks there in that, in that short distance is a direct result of the, uh, of the construction. From employees from the community safety building, uh, the residents that live on Mystic Street um, park on on Sachem as well as the, the driveway into the cemetery uh, routinely, and they've done that prior to construction as well. Thank you. Um, with all due respect to the chief, Mr. Moderator, am I able to ask a question? The same question, uh, perhaps to be answered by an abutter uh, or someone um, with a second opinion, perhaps even Mr. Harrington. Is that allowed? I'll, I'll address it to Mr. Harrington, but as long as you keep his answer short and sweet and doesn't argue the And then I'll be done. I'll and try. I've learned so my lesson about Steve, protocol. <laughs> Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I'd ask to put up the presentation again that I oh, showed. Nope, just answer I, but the we question. Won't, we won't, don't no, argue uh, the point. Let me, I'd ask to put it up again because in that, half of the pictures were not during construction. They were during December or they were, you know, after the construction ended. The Cemetery Commission record goes back to 2007, when they said it was a long-standing problem long before any construction. Um, as early as this winter, there were cars parked in there every single day. Um, I, I, that's all I'll do, that's the answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, now another new guy, Mr. Cardin. Again, if someone wants to terminate debate, all they can say is I move to terminate debate in the article and all matters before it. Nothing else. <laughs> Len Cardin, Precinct 20, I move to terminate debate on Article 12 and all matters before us. Good job, Mr. Cardin. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, oh, excuse me, is it seconded? Okay, so, Mr. Flynn, can you turn your magic machine on for us? Motion to terminate debate, it's a two-thirds vote. Okay, go ahead and vote now. Hmm. Okay, time's up. 184 in the affirmative, 23 in the negative. Debate is terminated. 84, that's enough of that. Now, we have two motion, two substitute motions. We have Mr. Dude, I'm in charge. We have Mr. Stephen Harrington's initial substitute motion, and then we have an amendment made by Mr. Sean Harrington. Um, because we don't have anything before us but Mr. Harrington Stevens, we're going to vote on his first. If that prevails, then we're going to vote on Mr. Sean Harrington to see if we want to change the wording. Well, we don't have anything to vote on yet. You want to vote on the amendment first? Yes. All right, fine. I think it's kind of backwards. Either way it would work. So we are first going to vote on Sean Harrington's amendment, which... All right, so he's changing these words. Conducting cemetery business to visiting the cemetery. That's what he's doing, changing those three words from conducting cemetery business to visiting the cemetery. Do you all understand that? Yes. Okay. Mr. Flynn, this is a simple majority. Man, why does this keep clearing? This is Sean's. We have to fix this because it cleared on us. Ready? Okay. Go ahead and vote on Sean's. One yes, two no. Three, 
two, one, okay. All right, it is amended, 161 to 48, so it is amended. Now we have the, rec the substitute motion of Stephen Harrington as amended by Sean's, so no person shall park any vehicle in Mount Pleasant Cemetery except when visiting the cemetery, any person who violates this provision shall be subject to a fine of $25 for the first violation, 50 for the second violation, $100 for each subsequent violation. You ready over there? Uh, ready? Okay, go ahead. One yes, two no. Three abstain. Five seconds left. Two, one. Zero. Time's up. And 90 yes, 115 no, it fails. Well, five of you got to stand. Okay. Five people stand. Run through the screens, please. Look, they fixed Bob Jr. and Bob Sr. <laughs> okay, that's a negative vote on the article. It closes Article 12, moves us to Article 13. You don't want that, do you? You need Sean's? Yes, what's your point of order? Oh. Oh, it failed. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen for no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. And my vote is the recommended vote of no action prevails. So that brings us to Article 13. We have for us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to establish a poet laureate for the town of Arlington. Anyone want Mr. Byrne? This one shouldn't be as contentious, I would hope. We can hope not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Byrne, Board of Selectmen. Um, so the board voted to, or we are asking you to join us in voting to institute a poet laureate for the town of Arlington. Um, we believe it's a great way to honor an artist in the community, and uh, it further shows our continued support for the arts, uh, the entire arts community. It's a volunteer position, and the individual that is selected must be living in Arlington. Um, and we hope that you'll join us. We think it's um, just a great dedication. Thank you. Mr. Hainer? Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Is this for a set period of time, or is it for life? Um, Stephen Byrne, Board of Selectmen, it is for up to three years. Annually renewable for up to three years. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kim McKinney? Mr. McKinney, oh, you're volunteering for the job after that Uncle Sam song a couple of years ago? <laughs> Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7? No, that was, that was a verse. 
I rise to question this new article. A question I have a tiny particle. I think there is nothing worse to confuse poetry with verse. Verse is simple. Every time you write a sentence, it must rhyme. Poetry has special powers. Yeats said it took him 17 hours. At least to write a decent one, it really is not a lot of fun. So if we must select a bard, it's going to be very hard. To choose who is to choose, you see, to say, decide what is good poetry. Do we bring a bard, a prof, a teacher? What is the most important te feature? And to end this and to show what's worse, I will recite a perfect verse. There was one late, uh, written by my father, I might add, there about the, uh, an orchestral person. There is one lady in the bunch to take her, see her takes no special hunch, nor sight particularly sharp. She is the lass who hugs the harp. She has to have an early supper. She is the longest tuner upper. And seated there on her chair, proceeds to wind up the affair until the conductor's nod or frown sets her to stroking up and down. And after these chromatic bits, she simply sits and sits and sits. A harpist must have lots of pluck, a black silk costume, and a truck. That is verse. And I certainly hope that we have someone appointed who knows the difference between something that's clever. And by the way, you can ask many classical uh, harpists. A harpist must have lots of pluck, and they'll come back with that little line. That's how famous it got. So verse can be catchy. But I would like to suggest that there be some way of deciding who is supposed to decide whether it's going to be something elegiac or hallmark. That's all. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Mr. Deist? Okay, after that, of course. Um, anyone else wish to speak to the article? Oh, sir. You want to speak to the article? He's going to try and outdo him. Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Um, I have a question. Does, does the poet laureate have to be a poet, or is this just, we just pick somebody who may? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Byrne. Well, um, we don't pick someone. It is someone appointed by a majority vote of the Board of Library Trustees, the School Committee, the Arlington Commission on, well, maybe the Arlington Commission on Art, Arts and Culture, uh, depending on if they get their name change, um, a town meeting member appointed by the town moderator, and the town manager. But there's no limit. We could be somebody, could be a video artist or a sculptor. Or, I mean, yeah, I, I think that would be. So it, should we maybe not call it Poet Laureate if it's well, going to be well, like... It's, um, th this position is in several communities as a Poet Laureate, and I don't think they've had any issues with so it. So I, I, I have another... I as far as I'm concerned, they're going to be a poet. So well, my vote's for we, Poet. Oh. I can have a, a suggestion that maybe... We, we've already got a measure of bark, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe we, before we create another ridiculous position, Maybe, should we, maybe we can swap one for the other or something? Well, maybe... that, that's not before us right now, and I don't think it's that ridiculous of a position. Thank you. Okay, well, that, that's all. Gentleman in blue over here. Yep. This really should be pretty non-controversial, I would think. Nathan Swilling, you can call me Nate. I move to terminate debate, precinct four. <laughs> All right, we have a motion to terminate debate. And it's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. We have before us to recommend the vote of the Board of Selectmen for establishing a poet laureate for the town of Arlington. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is a unit. It's not a unit. It's a majority vote, and I so declare it. And that terminates Article 13. and brings us to Article 14. Uh, public music, busking. Yeah. No, not till Monday. This is a uh, busking, Mr. Koch's favor. You going to speak to this, Steve? Yeah. Do you want to? You don't have to. 
Okay, go for it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so the board voted in favor of this, and it will, um, we believe that allowing individuals to perform on our streets is a great way to make our community a little more vibrant. Um, I think it's important to note that the current bylaws do allow for music to be played currently um, on public ways with the approval of the Board of Selectmen. And uh, this warrant is, uh, it is really more comprehensive and uh, better explains um, what is expected from the street performers in town. And uh, I hope you'll join us in supporting it. And I think um, at our meeting we had a you know, great wave of support and I think it will be, um, be a nice addition to the town, especially in nice weather. Thank you. Thank you. Go for it. Yep. You've been waiting for this for years. <laughs> Ed Sharp. Mr. Sharp. Oops. I'm Ted Sharp, Precinct 7. Um, I, uh, you may remember I spoke out uh, on the floor of town meeting a, a year ago in, uh, in, favor, in favor of remedying this obvious injustice that uh, the bylaw says you can perform music, it singles out music as, a, as an expressive medium, um, with a license from the selectmen. However, I'm the only one crazy enough, I think, that's actually asked. And if you ask the selectmen for a license, they say, well, what? You, you want to perform, when do you want to perform? Well, whenever, whenever I feel like it. I just, I want, I want to busk. I want to play music on the street whenever the spirit moves me. And they just sort of look at you funny. No, nobody's ever asked. You can't, you have to have a license, but you can't get a license. So uh, it's, it's kind of a silly situation. It, it, it's just, it's not very nice to say you have to have a license and then not have licenses available. And I mean, it is a constitutionally protected uh, form of expression, it's First Amendment rights. Anyway, this is not the most important thing we're gonna be dealing with in town meeting. I understand that, I'm gonna to try to be brief. Uh, have you ever gone to Harvard Square, Davis Square, Quincy Market to shop or dine? You go there because there are great shops and great places to dine. But there's also stuff happening on the street. It's kind of fun. Uh, busking is something that d is uh, an amenity. It adds something to the community. Uh, the performers love it. You immediately know how well you're doing because people either pass you on by or they stand there for a minute and listen. Uh, it's great for the audience. You get to hear some good music occasionally. Not all the time. <laughs> and you can keep moving if you don't like what you're hearing. Uh, and I won't tell you what happens to me when I, when I do it. Um, and the tourists love it. They say, oh, how colorful, what a vibrant place this is. This is really, this is really a fun thing. I guess we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, so um, the, the, the process is gonna be simple. You say, I'm interested in a permit. They'll give you a permit and a sheet of paper that defines the most obvious forms of obnoxious behavior that won't be tolerated. And if you're irritating, they take away your permit and that's that. It's, a, it's gonna be a simple, effective system. The selectmen will establish reasonable regulations. You're not gonna be able to cover every contingency. And stick with me just a minute here. I, I, can, see, I can see the wheels turning. You're thinking, oh my gosh, are we gonna have a 50-piece brass band with a megawatt amplification system blocking the entrance to the Capitol Theater? No, you're not. You're not because I'm the only person crazy enough to even have expressed an interest. This is not a big deal. <laughs> the best case scenario is that we'll share in a little bit of the fun. The worst case scenario, and it's, I believe in my heart of hearts, the most likely scenario, nothing much will happen. So the current bylaw singles out music. You know, we don't have uh, jugglers uh, with uh, uh, flaming chainsaws uh, riding unicycles. It's not gonna happen. Don't single out the worst case scenario in your mind and try to perfect this in some way that covers all contingencies. Let's just get this done. We're correcting an obvious injustice. We'll have some fun if we're lucky. 
If we're very unlucky, nothing will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Um, Mr. Trembley. Ed. You really want to talk to this? Ed Trembley, Precinct uh, 19. Um, I'm actually amused to find that there was somebody who actually was trying to play because I can't remember hearing anybody play and I kind of wish people would. Um, I mean, has there, has there been a problem with, uh, I, mean, I guess I, I'm hearing that there has been a problem with getting a permit. I was not even aware that we had permits for this. I thought the question was we were gonna create permits. So, so we already have permits for this. Is this right, Mr. Moderator? Got me. <laughs> Doug, okay, Mr. Heim? Start from the beginning. It only covers music. It only oh. covers music. Why do we even have permits at all? Well, if they're really bad, we want to get rid of them. We can pull their permit. Well, if, if they're really bad, people just walk away and don't give them any money, and then they'll leave on their own accord. But uh, um, I, is, is there ever going to be a fee attached to this? Um, Doug? No, or um, Mr. Byrne, no fee. No fee. And how tough is it going to be to get a permit? I mean, I, I kind of, I, I used to like when I, when I was young and there was spontaneous entertainment in Harvard Square. I, I thoroughly enjoyed going down and watch it. And w when I start hearing about fees and permit, or I guess no fees, but when I started about hearing about permits, I think, my gosh, they're going to kill off whatever attempt at music we have here in Arlington. Like they kind of killed off the entertainment in Harvard Square. It's not nearly what it used to be. And... So would it be possible just to eliminate the music and have no fees, no permits? If you want to play, you come, show up and play? Mr. Is Heim it, wants to address possible? that. Mr. Town Council wants to address that. Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, I think it's important to note that there already is a bylaw that requires a permit process. Whether that permit process is developed into regulations and things like that, there currently is a bylaw on public music. The, major things that this uh, bylaw would help us with is uh, expanding it to other forms of art and I think that uh, and I don't want to speak for anybody but the bylaw is also oriented around encouraging public music and not making it look quite as discouraging as the current language looks um, in section 18. Uh, there are reasonable time place and manner restrictions that people express concern about and those are the types of things that go into a regulation of this type of activity, but nothing that is, is, is overly burdensome from a regulation or a licensing standpoint. For, frankly, I don't think anybody would be uh, playing music at 9 o'clock at night because there's nothing open anyways. But, <laughs> um, is it possible to, to, to take them, to, to kill off the, the whole music thing and just have this a, a free and open forum? So if somebody feels the need to desire to play music, they can go do that without having to go through all this regulatory stuff? Is that possible? You'd have to come back next year with the Warren article okay. to get rid of the bylaw. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Leonard? Mr. Sean Harrington. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, I'm just hoping that, oh, by the way, my clock's not on. Uh, uh, I'm just hoping that we're, you know, I'm fine with this. I actually like the idea of having music out in Arlington Center, but I'm just hoping we're not going to get in a huge thing about noise and what level they're supposed to be at and all that stuff. So my first question is, is are they allowed to have amps at all or are they, I mean, is there going to be any regulation on amps, seeing as we're now starting to Mr. kind of Heim, more detailed? Town Council is going to address your issue. Doug Heim, Town Council. The bylaw is only oriented towards changing the existing language to make it a little bit more welcoming mm -hmm. and to expanding it to beyond music. The regulations that the Board of Selectmen would then promulgate pursuant to the bylaw would address those types of issues, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that would be done in a public hearing where people could express their views. All right. So currently there is nothing in the bylaws about noise regulation or amps or anything like that. I'm assuming this was right before that. But. I, I don't want to say that there's no, nothing in the town bylaws about noise, but there's nothing about there's nothing in the current bylaw as it exists or in this new bylaw that specifically says other than reasonable you know, um, uh, times, place, and, and, and level of respect for residential neighbors and things like that. So all those things would have to be worked out pursuant to specific regulations to address those types of concerns that you have. All right. Um, 
Thank you very much. Like I said, I think that's a good thing. I just don't want to, you know, we know how people love to come in here about noise or bug zappers or whatever. You know, it's like I don't want to be here next town meeting having someone say, you know, some guy dressed in a uh, bear costume playing an elect uh, guitar outside was playing too loud for me to, um, or whatever, you know. So hopefully we can pass this and no one in town meeting will try to put any real noise regulation on it. So we keep on, this becomes like the forever issue of music pl being played. Sure. Thank you very much. Mr. Coro. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Joseph Coro, uh, Precinct 15, also a member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I did bring this proposal before the board, and I want to thank my colleagues for, for supporting it. Um, and uh, Mr. Sharp had come and, and testified on it. Um, to Mr. Tremblay's point, I know it's a little counterintuitive, but when we did some research on this, some of the communities that have the most vibrant street performance cultures are the ones that do have regulations on the books. And I think the town council actually accurately um, expressed it. The idea is that, that this is really um, set, setting out a statement that we encourage, we actually encourage some of this behavior. And it doesn't just involve busking. Um, in just my two years on the board, we've had a number of situations where we've had some proposals for street festivals and such that have come to us we kind of make up the rules each time they, they come and we set out the parameters and, and set the conditions on an ad hoc basis. This will set up a, a, um, <clears throat> a framework whereby we can adopt a common set of regulations that any you know, group or individual that comes to us can, can um, um, adhere to. We'll have it uh, already uh, set in place. The intention is that um, if uh, town meeting should pass this, the Board of Selectmen would um, adopt a more comprehensive set of regulations to address some of the, the uh, questions that Mr. Harrington raised and uh, some other questions that I'm sure a number of you um, have. Um, Mr. Heim helped me um, on this. We did research some other um, ordinances. It was felt that um, placing this um, in the regulatory realm would actually give us more flexibility to address certain situations. For example, I just give you, for, for example, without debating the regulations themselves, um, some ordinances, you know, specifically, for lack of a better word, cordon off or specify after public hearing areas where this, this uh, behavior is not encouraged or, or is, is not um, allowed. It will, uh, regulations tend to uh, address noise, amplification, hours, um, you know, how close to buildings you can be to make sure that there's free passage on the public ways. It's for all of these, these reasons. So. Should town meeting uh, support this, and I hope that you will, um, I, my understanding is that the board will then um, uh, work on adopting regulations to actually implement it so that when Mr. Sharp or another uh, individual who is interested visits our office, we do have actually a, a set set of rules that we can um, issue to them and they can um, acknowledge receipt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate. Second. Motion to terminate debate on, matter, on the article and all matters before it. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous vote to terminate debate and so declare it. We now have before us to recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen for public music. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's unanimous vote and I so declare it. That terminates Article 40. Yes, ma'am. What's your point of privilege, Ms. Fiore? Uh, it has to do with my very important How about if we reserve that to the announcements and resolutions? There's an article I'd like to get to tonight because the people have been waiting all evening. Well, I've been waiting all evening, too. I know, but, you're, <laughs> but these are citizens of the town. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, Ms. <laughs> Elsie, please, can we wait till Monday night? You're, the gentleman did make fun of your position, and I uh, castigate him for doing that. I know, but they, yeah, come forward. <laughs> this isn't an actual point of personal privilege, though. Point of personal privilege is the hall is uncomfortable, someone is noisy. The gentleman was rude, I agree with you. Elsie Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, this is the third year I've had the honor of being the measure of wooden bark. 
Uh, prior to that, uh, John Fitzmaurice held the role, his wife held the role for years, and I don't know, somebody else did for years. Uh, the reason I'm, uh, I don't mind being laugh, people laughing, it doesn't bother me. I laugh to myself sometimes at funny things. However, the, uh, every city and town has to have a measure of wooden bark. It's, um, I gather, part of the state law. And in the olden days, the measure of wooden bark had a, had a you know, an office downtown, so to speak. And if somebody, it covers uh, wood and bark and also charcoal, I found out when I uh, was appointed and looked into it. So you can get 12 bags of charcoal, for instance, and if you think you've been cheated, you would call them measure of wooden bark. And the same for a cord of wood has to, they have to be a certain width and length and if you've been cheated because they've cut a couple of them short, then you would call them measure of wooden bark. Uh, the measure of wooden bark would get paid by the person whose uh, materials he's examining. So it is uh, really, um, you can laugh all you want, I don't mind, I laugh, at, like I said, I laugh at things, but it is uh, a real position. So if uh, any of you are appointed after me, remember that you are a real person in a real position. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fiore, we appreciate your service. At previous Article 15, Cultural Commission, Mr. Byrne. What are you trying to do here? Change the name? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes, it is a simple name change. Um, the Cultural Commission and the um, Cultural Council often get confused, so this is to change the name to the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, ACAC, to alleviate that confusion. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the article? This is Costa. Barbara Costa, Precinct 10. I'm actually one of the co-chairs of the Cultural Commission, which we'd like to now be called Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. It's really a minor thing. We're just making a baby step towards separating ourselves for for just clarification purposes. We think it's, we really wanna make an effort to gather all the different arts groups in town and be an umbrella of sorts. And that's our mission and we wanna separate it. We don't give money, we don't have money, we don't have a penny actually. And, and the Arts Council, I mean the Cultural Council does give, uh, does it, uh, administer funds that come from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. They're, one of the things we want to do on the, and we want to be, by the way, called not ACAC, but CultureCom. That's what we're going to, that's our short name. So we're CultureCom, like there's FinCom and other ConCom. Um, and just want to, we want to help you understand what all the different ways are that the arts organizations work together in town. We were very happy that um, Mr. Byrne referred to the arts flourishing in Arlington, and we think so too. That's all I wanted to say. This is a really straightforward issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the article? Okay, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to rename the Cultural Commission to the Commission on Arts and Culture. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote and I so declare it. That closes Article 15 and brings us to Article 16. Mr. O'Connor, you get the big chair. I'm gonna step down on this one because I've been representing the people and there's a conflict of interest and they're my friends. We have before us Article 16. Um, is Ms. Long present or Attorney Leone? Mr. Chapdelaine. Um, thank you very much. I am going to yield shortly to Mr. Chapdelaine, but I just want to say that the board fully supports um, the work Mr. Chaplain has done as well as the proponents of this article. So without further ado. Thank you, uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. 
So I want to uh, begin by calling your attention to the supplemental report of the Board of Selectmen that was placed in your chairs Monday evening. Uh, contained within that supplemental report uh, is the recommended vote along with an agreement that has been executed between the town and the article proponents uh, that you're going to hear about tonight. All right. So Warrant Article 16 was filed by 10 registered voters uh, and involves a request from the owners of the property at 55 Venner Road for the town to release exterior lines which were taken in 1942. So shown on the screen behind me is a map of the property with the exterior lines shown in red. So you can see the dotted red lines and the top red line uh, matches the parcel boundary uh, on, the, on the top part of that map. So these exterior lines allowed the town to hold the property as unbuildable so that a roadway could be constructed at a future date. The current property owners purchased the property in 1955. The town no longer has any intention of constructing a roadway on this property. So on behalf of the, the Board of Selectmen, I negotiated with the property owners and their legal counsel in regard to terms by which the town might consider releasing the exterior lines. And this discussion was informed by a prior debate of town meeting in 2006 in regard to this very matter. At that time, concerns in regard to impact on abutters were discussed, and there were also concerns raised in regards to the appropriate financial compensation for the town if they were to release the exterior lines. In regards to the concerns of abutters, the owner of the property at 55 Venner Road has reached an agreement to sell a portion of the property to the most immediate abutter to serve as a buffer zone for a potential development on the site if the exterior lines were to be released. In regard to financial concerns, I took the uh, position that in order, consider, excuse me, in order to consider releasing the exterior lines, that the town should be compensated for the present value of the amount that the town paid for the property rights in 1942. The amount paid in 1942 was $2,161. In today's dollars, the value is approximately $30,000. I also took the position that the town should be compensated for the tax revenue that it has foregone since the lot has been classified as unbuildable. Should the town release the exterior lines, the lot will become buildable and the current property owners who have enjoyed the benefit of the lot as open space for the past 60 years will now get the financial benefit of the lot becoming buildable. However, in mass general law, there is a precedent for a concept called rollback taxes, which apply to situations where a property's, uh, if a property's use or allowance of use is changed, uh, tax, uh, property taxes uh, can be rolled back and collected. So though, the, uh, though these laws don't speak to this specific situation, they guided my thinking while negotiating the matter with the property owners. So based on this, we looked at the amount of taxes that the property owners would have paid had the lot been buildable going back to the year 2000, so the past 15 years. And this amounted to approximately $35,000. So based upon these two figures, the $30,000 based on the present value of the amount paid um, by the town for acquiring the rights in 1942, and also the $35,000 amount based on the reduced taxes we have entered into an agreement, again, that was placed on the chairs Monday night with the property owners, which would release the exterior lines in exchange for compensation to the town in the total amount of $65,000. The Board of Selectmen has moved favorable action in regard to this matter, and I also respectfully ask that town meeting approve the release of the exterior lines in accordance with the terms of the agreement, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Mr. Leone? Come on up, Denise and Mary. It's been several years since I've stood here. I'm going to ask you tonight to um, allow Denise Long and her mother, Mary Kukaris, the owners of the property. Oh, John Leone, Precinct 8. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I even forgot my own rules. So I'm going to ask that you. Yep. Uh, That's better. I'm going to ask that you um, allow Mary and clock, clock, clock. clock. Are you trying to get it? <laughs> oh, no. I even labeled the buttons. Yes, top I right, seven top left button. Start. Oh, well, I'm going to keep going. So I'm going to ask that you um, listen to Mary and um, <laughs> Denise, and hold on. Eventually, vote in favor to release the property lines. The they have been trying to sell the property for several years. They are unable to do so because the title insurance companies will not write title insurance, which basically precludes them 
from being able to sell the property. Mary can no longer live in the home. She wants to sell it, move on to a condo here in Arlington. And we've arranged a, a good debt benefit for the town. We've established a precedent of actually that rollback taxes, which is something that's never been done before in Arlington, as far as I know. So we hope we're setting a precedent for the future that we, the town will have something to lean on that says this is what we've done in the past. The, build, the lot is actually about 18, 19,000 square feet. It could be three buildable lots, but what they've done is made a agreement with the abutters to sell them 2,500 square feet, which would lower the total square footage to less than the amount needed for three, so there'll only be two buildable lots left. Um, this satisfies the neighborhood, satisfies the abutters. Denise herself is an abutter of the home, so she doesn't want to see dense things um, built there either. So if you'll just hear what she has to say, and please vote in favor of this. Thank you. Hi, Denise Long. I live at 48 Pleasant View Road. This is my mother, Mary Kokaris. She has worked for the town of Arlington for 31 years in the Counseling Services Department at Arlington High School. And we submitted this Warren article on her behalf, Article 16. My parents have lived at 55 Venner for actually 52 years. Originally, when the Warren article was proposed, it was in order to build a handicapped accessible house on their other lot because my father had been ailing. However, since then, a year and a half ago, my father has passed away and my mother has a bad back. So she's particularly challenged by living there in part because the existing house is an upside down house. It has a kitchen, full bath and master bedroom on the second floor. Ultimately, it was her need for a one for a living situation that was the reason that she put her, on the, put her house on the market last year. However, even in this hot real estate market, the house did not sell. Each time, the offers fell through at the purchase and sale, and the buyer's attorney said that the existence and location of the paper road made the property unsaleable. One attorney mom hired suggested that we as sellers get title insurance on behalf of the buyers, but even that was a dead end. The title insurers themselves said the paper road was a titling blemish and made the property ineligible for title insurance. So mom had to take the property off the market. All the attorneys, however, kept saying the same thing, that the only way to make the property saleable was to have the easement restriction removed and that only the town had the authority to do so. And that's why we're here tonight asking for your help. As Mr. Chapdelaine said, we've worked with them to come up with an agreement in order to address any concerns the removal of the easement restriction would cause. We've reached an agreement to reimburse the town for the money that they paid for the restriction and the bulk of the forfeited back taxes. And we've worked out agreement with Donna and her husband in order to sell 2,500 square feet to them to ensure that we, my mom has done everything within her financial means to preserve the character of the neighborhood. And we would appreciate your consideration of her warrant article. Thank you. The gentleman in front of Mr. Garb uh, to the left of Mr. Garbley. Um, I, I can't think of his name. The gentleman with the black, yes, come forward please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, town has taken the position that it wants to be uh, repaid for the amount of money that it spent uh, back in 1942, uh, you know, brought to the present day. Uh, but the uh, rollback taxes are calculated uh, on a 15-year period. Uh, somewhere between 15 years and 1942. How do we decide that it was going to be a 15-year rollback period? Mr. Uh, Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Um, the, main, uh, the main decision was made through the negotiation with the property owners, uh, both A, a reasonableness factor of what seemed to be a reasonable amount, but also what was, uh, what was you know, set in that MGL as precedent. Again, this is not what is covered by that mass general law, but it did allow for some precedent. And there was a term, I believe, um, in two different options uh, of a period of, I think, of a 10 and a 15-year option. So that, that's what guided me in that regard. 
Thank you, that's all. Mr. Gilligan, did you raise your hand? No, sir. There was someone right behind you in the, in the red. I can't see who it is. Is there any further debate? Yes, sir. Come forward. E.J. Harris, Precinct 5. Um, so to be clear, the general laws of the Commonwealth don't actually entitle the town to roll back taxes. Is that correct? Adam Chapdelaine, uh, yes, that is correct. Is it the general intention of the leadership of the town uh, to collect taxes and payments to which it is not ordinarily entitled by law? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, I've not dealt with an analogous situation. That's an answer. Um, so I think it's easy to see how this happened, right? The, the town leaders decided 70 years ago, um, before the vast majority of us were born, that um, they might want to build a road here. The housing boom comes after the war. Things change. But I hope we all agree that forcible takings should only happen for, for important and exigent public purposes. Um, in retrospect, this was neither. And yet, the town proposes to profit from that taking. Um, the town apparently managed this taking incorrectly for 60 years by not redressing its, the, the, the incorrect taking in that entire period. So what we are asking a town landholder to do in accepting this payment is to compensate us for our mistake and our mismanagement. I say we're asking them to do it. That's not actually true. We're demanding it as a surcharge on the just settlement of an interest we never needed and shouldn't have. There is a word for that in English. It's extortion. Uh, this deal bothers me. It really bothers me a lot. Um, I think the concept that we are entitled uh, to take back taxes, take taxes that we never assessed, um, that the law does not entitle us to, in order to release a property so that a town landholder can sell it, is frankly disgusting. Um, this deal makes my stomach turn. Um, if it does you as well, um, I hope you'll vote no tonight. If you do, I will serve notice of reconsideration. That will allow plenty of time for the town manager and the property holders uh, to go back to settle a deal that doesn't involve a taking based on our mistake from a town, from a landholder at the point of a gun. He can come back with a new number. We can reconsider. We can release the property in, in the next week. I think it's easy to imagine that that's easily done. Um, I encourage you to vote no. I think this sets a hugely problematic precedent. And the fact that we're talking about it as a precedent, as a taking that we can do and then profit from, is incredibly problematic. And I urge you to oppose. Mr. Mr. Fuller? Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Um, $65,000, the town's done nothing to get that money. This is a great deal. We should help the homeowner out and vote yes. End of story. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Scott Smith, Precinct 5, move the question. We have a motion to terminate debate. I haven't tried these clickers. Let's do the clickers. What's that? Oh, it's a two-thirds vote. Okay. So we have 20 seconds. Okay.
We're ready. Uh, we're taking a, taking a vote to terminate debate. I did. What did he do? I pressed the timer. Hold on. John, what did you do to this thing? It doesn't seem to work. Take a voice vote. Okay. We'll take a voice vote. All in favor of termination of debate? Yes. All against? No. Chair is in doubt. We'll have to take a vote. If you can show me the clock thing here. I press this button. Yeah, I know it, it cleared. Okay. The other moderator actually cleared the machine before he left. We'll take a vote now. We ready? Terminate debate. Okay, debate is closed. As we here have a termination of debate, so we'll take the question. All in favor? What? The, yeah. Okay. Where's the time limit? Three. Three. Why is that? Okay, the, the question before us is Article 16, to release the exterior lines, provide the easement, and accept the, uh, the agreement as proposed by the town manager and the proponents. So we'll start the, the vote. Vote is closed. Motion carries. It's an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor of adjournment? Wait a minute. Motion for reconsideration. Do we have any resolutions? Uh, uh, motions, for motions for reconsideration? Article 16. Article 16. Okay. Okay. All in favor of adjournment. Please. All in favor and adjournment, please say aye for Monday. Okay, come back Monday. Start at 8 o'clock.